All right. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be with you here today. Uh, I'm Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of University Libraries. And before we get started, I just wanted to cover a um, brief housekeeping note about our session here on Microsoft Teams today. Jen's going to share a slide with some info on that. All right. So uh, just some tips for a successful virtual session here on Teams this morning. Um, you know, it's, if you could please keep your microphones muted uh, until you're directed to unmute during the session, that way we can ensure we hear Jordan loud and clear throughout. That's the little microphone symbol at the top there. Um, you can share uh, your kudos, reactions, et cetera, via the chat function today. And that's uh, circled in blue here on the slide. It's a little bubble icon. Um, you can use the hand raise slash reactions uh, button. That's the little circular face with the hand up there to uh, notify uh, speakers and Jordan today if you want to share and engage without interrupting. Uh, of course, we'd love to hear your questions, so please don't hesitate to ask them. Um, and you could also uh, use, a, use reaction buttons there to do uh, applause and other kinds of things. And then uh, there is live captioning available as well uh, for access for enhanced accessibility. And that is the three dots ellipses button circled in yellow here on the slide where you can activate it. So thank you very much, um, Jen, for that info. And so, as I said, I'm Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of University Libraries, and it is my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to our graduate research series, uh, which is collaboratively hosted, <coughs> excuse me, by the University Libraries, Graduate Student Senate, and the Faculty Senate. Uh, in the series, it highlights the research process of graduate students, um, sharing not only the substance of their research, but the successes, challenges, and use of information resources um, that they experience throughout the research process. And the presenters for our series are selected by the Graduate Research Series Committee, which uh, consists of librarians and staff from the libraries, as well as uh, Graduate Student Senate. So this morning, I am very pleased to welcome our presenter, Jordan Zinak, excuse me, um, a doctoral candidate in history. Jordan's presentation, Violence and Memory, Lynching in the Midwestern United States, seeks to answer the uh, question of why lynching, Jim Crow laws, and black codes are associated with the South and they were also found in Northern states. Uh, Jordan's research uh, stems from a variety of, and, and her research used a variety of resources such as the Southeast um, Ohio History Center, Mount Zion Baptist Church, and, uh, and the University Libraries. Uh, and left the libraries, Jordan worked with Lorraine Wachna, our subject librarian for African American studies, um, to locate materials pertinent to her research. Uh, Jordan uh, holds a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Pittsburgh, a master's degree in history from Ohio University, and uh, Jordan's research is in gender and race relations in the United States. So without further ado, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce Jordan. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Romanowski, for that introduction. And thank you to the Graduate Research Series Committee and Graduate Student Senate uh, for selecting me and giving me the opportunity to present today. And thank you to everyone in the audience that, that came to my talk to listen. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here and get my PowerPoint presentation up. It's loading. I okay. can see it, Jordan. Perfect. Great. Okay. Um, so, of course, Dean already said that the title of my talk today is Violence and Memory, Lynching in the Midwestern United States. Okay. Am I frozen? A little bit, yes. Okay. Um, I don't get the best service in my office so i'm going to shut off my camera just for a little bit to see if it loads a little better um so 
basically just to give you a quick uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'll basically go over the process of my thesis research um, and how the library resources uh, helped me through that process. Um, my involvement with the Christopher Davis Community Remembrance Project and our collaboration with the Equal Justice Initiative and my plans to expand my thesis research for my larger dissertation project. And first, I just want to um, acknowledge that just a few weeks ago, Congress passed the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill, uh, making lynching officially a federal hate crime. Um, and it took from 1892, when Ida B. Wells Barnett was the first person uh, to start the anti-lynching campaign uh, until 2022 uh, to get this bill passed through Congress. Um, so it's astounding that it has taken so long, but it does make for a very timely talk today. And let me see if I pop back up. Okay, you should be able to see me and okay. And here's the second slide here. So for my thesis, um, I use the lynching of Christopher Davis as um, a case study to exemplify characteristics of lynchings across the United States. Um, and I just want to begin, who was Christopher Davis? He was a 24 year old uh, black American uh, farmhand. He had a wife named Kinzaya, who he liked to call Issa, and two kids, a three-year-old daughter named Roberti and a, a, an infant son named Silas. And he lived in Albany, Ohio in Lee Township. And essentially he was accused of assault of a white woman named Lucinda Lucky, uh, whom he used to work for. And he was lynched on November 21st, 1881. And as he awaited trial to present his defense against these charges of assault, 30 to 50 men broke into the jail cell where, where he was being held, dragged him to the South Bridge, which is around where Baker Center is today on Ohio University's campus, and essentially hanged him from the bridge. Okay. So this project began for me when my advisor, Dr. Katherine Jellison, introduced me to a coalition that was working to commemorate Christopher Davis. Um, this topic seemed to be not very well known. A lot of people didn't really know that this happened right here in Athens, Ohio. And um, the coalition was kind of searching for a historian to find out more, to find out more about Christopher Davis's life um, and uh, about the lynching. Uh, so it was no better time for me to arrive at OU. I came here in 2018 in the master's program in the history department, and I came in studying race relations and gender. Um, so I was right on board with this topic. This um, was the perfect time. I came here when this coalition was just getting together. Uh, so it was right up my alley and I was very excited to to start researching. And um, Ada Woodson Adams, she is a local genealogist. She's a member of Southeast Ohio History Center in uh, a member of our coalition, the Christopher Davis Community Remembrance Project. She had already begun doing a little bit of research and she shared some of her findings with me. And here is a picture of the census records, which is something we just kind of started with just to see um, descriptions of Christopher Davis. Um, we saw, you know, that Lucinda Lucky was his neighbor, um, the ages of him and his family. And um, actually he was uh, described as a mulatto in this, um, in this census record, which is a term for a mixed race person. And you can tell by this portrait here that he does have some very white looking features um, you know, almost as if he could be white passing um, based on this drawing of him. Okay. So when I first arrived, 
um, in 2018 to OU and the master's program, I was a little bit unfamiliar on how to navigate Alden, Alden Library's resources. Uh, so I reached out to the subject librarian for African American Studies, Lorraine Wachna. Um, and she was so helpful to me. She showed me how to navigate the library's databases, um, you know, to discover which towns reported on this lynching, um, which databases were best to use to search, how to do keyword searches um, to find reports on the lynching and on Christopher Davis. So she was absolutely helpful. And the newspapers that I found through the library's website were just instrumental to my thesis project. Um, I also ordered books through OhioLink. So OhioLink is a program that um, Alden Library has that connects different libraries throughout all of Ohio. So if I needed a book and it wasn't at directly at Alden Library, they would reach out to another li library throughout Ohio and order that for me. Um, which was great. I just wanted to do um, a lot of secondary source reading to establish my credibility on the topic of lynchings throughout the U.S., um, you know, to become an authority on, on that subject. Um, yeah, so the local newspapers I found, um, there were a number of them, some being the Athens Messenger, the Athens Journal, the Logan Hawking Centennial, just to name a few, um, but I just kept finding biases. Um, the automatic assumption of Christopher Davis's guilt of this crime, uh, and they referred to him as the Black Beast and described the mob's actions as protecting white women and this group of uh, brave, bold men, uh, just justifying the mob's actions. Uh, and defaming Christopher Davis's name, uh, which is a commonality across lynchings throughout the US. Um, just the automatic assumption of black, black guilt and um, justification for this extrajudicial murder. So with the case of Christopher Davis, um, there was really no formal investigation that took place to look into the crime, no attempts to prove his innocence, and no attempts to look at mob action to um, punish the members for this murder. So to expand my research and to try to find out a little bit more and dig, dig further, um, I traveled to Chester Hill, Ohio to the Multicultural Genealogical Center and this is just a center where people do research to document and preserve black history, uh, diverse history, multicultural history. Um, and there I found the Michelle and Cornelia Predrule collection. And this was a couple who had met in France and Cornelia actually got a job working at OU. And the couple worked to, together to compilate a history of black Appalachia um, and they just left this huge filing cabinet of primary source documents about um, Black Americans in this area. So searching through those documents, I came across the Meigs County Republican, and this was the first document that suggested Davis's in, um, innocence of the crime. And Christopher Davis was from Meigs County. He grew up there, so it might have been an area where people were um, more willing to attest to his character. Um, and from, from these documents, some reasonable doubts started to surface. So just to name a few of the reasonable doubts that I came across, um, one was that Christopher Davis's neighbors uh, said that he was with, he was eating dinner with them at their house during the time of the crime. Um, so if he had gotten a chance to go to trial, he could have presented an alibi and presented this as part of his defense um, uh, against this crime. Um, another um, reasonable doubt was that he went to church the next morning um, where apparently he, he learned about the attack on Lucinda Lucky. And you would think that someone who would commit such a heinous crime might have wanted to hide after 
especially being a black American, um, you know, you would think that he wouldn't go right out into public. Um, but that's just my speculation. It's just my thoughts. And the only thing I can do with this information is speculate. Um, and one of the more prominent reasonable doubts was that Lucinda Lucky stayed with Christopher Davis. Part of her house had burnt down and it was overgoing renovations. And she stayed with Christopher Davis uh, for weeks. So that suggested to me that there was some kind of comfortable comfortability between the two of them uh, that if an assault were to have happened, maybe it would have happened during this time when she stayed with him. Um, and then the, uh, another um, reasonable doubt um, was I found a letter that he had wrote to his wife and it kind of just stated that he felt that trouble was coming upon him um, that, and he just basically said, I'm innocent of the crime, uh, things like that. So there was this back and forth of letters to the editor between fair play, so it, these, these men, um, I assu I'm assuming they were men, but um, fair play was a pseudonym and justice was a pseudonym that they wrote to, letters to the ed editor and fair play was the one um, explaining uh, these reasonable doubts and alluding to Christopher Davis's innocence and justice was challenging uh, his accusations and saying no, Christopher Davis is guilty. So there was a, a lot of back and forth uh, within these newspapers. But just either way, the point I'm trying to make guilty or, or innocent, Davis just should have had a right to a trial to prevent, present his defense. Uh, if he were white, he would have, have had that chance um, that in this murder wouldn't have happened. So basically new information came to the forefront and our coalition was able to tell um, the complexities uh, behind the lynching of Christopher Davis. And I actually found another document from the 1930s that Sheriff Warden, he was the one who tried to keep Davis in his jail, jail cell, tried to prevent the mob's actions, but ultimately failed. Um, he was interviewed in the 1930s and he identified members of the mob and some, uh, one person was Lucinda Lucky's son, uh, one was her nephew, and one member that he identified actually went on to be a local judge. So this is just showing how people got away with this murder and even got to hold positions of authority within the community. Okay, so partnering, partnering with the Equal Justice Initiative, um, our coalition's leader, Sue Riggi, she was the she was the first one to reach out to the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and what is uh, EJI? Um, it's basically a nonprofit that seeks to provide lawyers for wrongly convicted Black Americans. Um, they work on things like ending mass incarceration, um, helping find justice for people on death row, uh, and they also like to spread awareness about racial violence throughout the U.S. And one way they do this is by funding markers uh, just to acknowledge victims of lynchings and it, as a way to help educate the public. So basically there were steps our coalition had to take to prove our dedication to wanting to commemorate Davis before the Equal Justice Initiative would agree to fund the marker. So the first, one of our first um, steps was uh, having this commemoration ceremony and the soil collection ceremony. Um, and you can see from these middle pictures, uh, these jars of soil. So basically we had, um, we had speakers there, uh, you know, from the Equal Justice Initiative, local black advocates, um, performers. This bottom left hand corner is Keziah Waters. He is a master's student in the performing arts department, uh, and he actually portrayed himself as Christopher Davis. It was a self performance and just absolutely powerful. Um, we had singers there who sang freedom songs and we had over 300 people in attendance, uh, which was amazing. But basically we had these jars of soil and the community members were able to walk up and we, we gathered at um, the lynching site, near the lynching site. And community members were able to walk up and um, 
shovel some dirt and soil from uh, the lynching site, which just is a powerful um, movement. And, you know, everyone got to kind of participate in this. So one jar of soil went to the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. And you can see these jars of soils. This top left hand corner is the um, state name with the victims of lynchings listed there. Um, yes, so one jar of soil went to the Legacy Museum and the other stayed at the Southeast Ohio History Center. I curated a museum exhibit along with members at the Southeast Ohio History Center um, and this jar of soil went on display at that exhibit. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think it's on display now, but the jar of soil is still there. Um, so after the commemoration ceremony, um, the Equal Justice Initiative agreed to fund the marker. And when it was erected, unfortunately, COVID had been widespread. So we had to have an online ceremony. Um, and again, we just had songs, reenactments, speeches, um, local Black advocates to talk. Um, the dean of the OU actually came and spoke. Uh, we, we held a local essay contest for high schoolers, um, which was really impressive. Um, they did some deep research about ra racial violence and EJI funded a partial scholarship for the essay contest winners, which was really, really awesome. So it seems to be a common misconception that lynching was a Southern phenomenon, um, which is just inaccurate. And it ignores how powerful and widespread white supremacy was. There was 18 recorded lynchings in Ohio alone. And it's important to acknowledge that not all lynchings went recorded. You know, there's mysterious disappearings. There's other forms of um, murder, uh, or it's not recorded in the newspaper as a lynching. So, um, but 18 recorded lynchings in Ohio. And this area of Southeast Ohio is typically known for its involvement with the Underground Railroad um, as a, a area where Black Americans migrated for education, um, which is important to acknowledge and it's great and we should be talking about those things. But events like this lynching just shows how widespread racist views were in these areas that were thought to have these good race relations. And these public history projects are important to draw attention and have these conversations and hopefully inform the public. And addressing past instances, I hope, will have, um, will create, um, will cause people to want to have conversations about the present and how uh, violence takes place still today in a different form uh, with police brutality, mass incarceration, things like that. But if people can't even address and reconcile with the past, how are we going to address the violence that is taking place today? And I, I'm just a firm believer that it's important to address the past if we want to make a better future. Okay, where is my research headed? Um, so my plan is to expand upon Midwestern lynchings to look at other lynch cases that were commemorated and involved with equal just with the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, like we did here in Athens. And surprisingly, there were only five cases commemorated. Um, so these are just in chronological order here. Uh, the first was George Johnson in Atchison, Kansas in 1870. He accidentally injured a white man while hunting and fled from the scene. And he was, he was only being charged with fleeing from a, the scene of the crime. But 50 men decided to lynch him and a crowd of 2,000 gathered to watch. And he was shot, beaten, dragged, and hanged. And law enforcement allowed the lynching to happen and no mob member was held accountable. And the second, of course, was Christopher Davis, which I've already discussed. And the third and fourth 
so two lynchings happened in Oxford, Ohio, and their commemoration project acknowledged both of these lynchings. Um, so the first was Simon Garnett in, in Oxford, Ohio, in Butler County in 1877. He was accused of assault of a white woman. Law enforcement failed to prevent the lynching and no one was held accountable. Uh, the other person lynched was Henry Corbin in 1892 who was accused of murdering a white woman. And he was hanged and shot over 400 times and law enforcement failed to prevent the lynching and no one was held accountable. And the fourth is probably the most well-known lynching out of these five. Uh, it was William Brown in Omaha, Nebraska in 1919. Um, the crowd was estimated to be between 1,000 and 5,000 people and they beat, hanged, shot, dragged, and set Will on fire. Law enforcement participated in the lynching and no one was held accountable. So this top left picture is one that you would often see um, portrayed in you know, books about lynching. Um, it, it's a common picture used. This is a picture of Will Brown and their com the commemoration and the, the marker. Um, so some similarities all five were accused of hurting white people. Four out of five uh, it was a white woman. And as I said, law enforcement either participated, did nothing, or failed to protect the victim. Okay, and here are the questions that uh, my dissertation will, will hope to address. So why are there only five lynchings commemorated in the Midwest? What makes communities willing to participate in these commemorations? Uh, why are some communities politically ready to acknowledge and commemorate? And OU, um, you know, it's a pretty progressive university in Athens. Um, it was a case of Will Brown in Omaha. It's a blue section in Nebraska. It's a big city. It has a significant black population. Uh, you know, it's a typical outlier in the state that is typically Republican. Um, so I would assume that a significant black population will probably uh, have a role in commemoration. You know, they might be more willing to commemorate and remember. Um, Oxford, Ohio, with the two, the cases of the two lynchings um, in Miami of Ohio University, you know, there's the presence of this liberal arts school. Um, so these are just some ideas that I'm, I'm starting to, to think about. Uh, so was there a unique pattern that Midwestern lynchings took? And I've already addressed that there are these similarities with hurting a white person with the involvement of law enforcement. And what does the history of lynchings in the Midwest tell us about racial and gender politics that would be different or similar to usual patterns? Uh, is the idea of commemoration recognizing as individual human beings? So maybe we would wanna put individual names and faces to these acts of violence. Um, it gives it more meaning. And uh, why is it that we associate black codes, Jim Crow and lynchings strictly with the South. And I think a lot of that has um, has to do with the legacy and misconception um, of the Civil War. Um, so most Northerners and Midwesterners relied on slavery too for cotton and textiles for their factories. Slavery also ensured a clear racial hierarchy that ensured white privileges and um, in the association of blackness with slavery. Um, you know, even abolitionists, not not all of them meant they supported equality. Some did, but not a lot of them. Uh, and a lot of Northerners and Midwesterners didn't want to compete with Black Americans for jobs. So a lot of um, white people in the North and Midwest, they were against that great migration of Black Americans fleeing the South after the end of slavery, uh, you know, going to the North, going to the West. Uh, because of the unwillingness to share white spaces with black Americans. Um, you know, they didn't want to say a lot of people didn't want to see um, black economic advancement, uh, black representation in politics. 
And this is one thing coming back to Ida B. Wells. This is one thing that she pointed out um, as the true motivation for lynchings throughout her pamphlets. Um, she used statistics to show that rape accusations of lynch victims were often false after the victim was lynched. There, it was either a consensual relationship or um, the white woman um, admitted to false claims or often it was the white men making these accusations. And we have to remember that rape was often deemed anything inappropriate to white society. So it didn't have to necessarily be uh, penetration. It could be talking to a white woman, um, looking at a white woman wrong, um, getting too close, something like that was equated to rape. Um, so lynching, like Black Codes, like Jim Crow, um, were used to keep Black Americans in a position of second-class citizenship and deny rights and privileges in order to maintain the racial hierarchy. So these are some questions my future research is going to explore. Um, and I'm basically going to use memory as my theoretical framework to discuss the gendered and racial reasons behind Midwestern lynchings. Okay, so thank you so much for listening and I have time for if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Jordan. So yeah, we're going to open it up uh, to the audience for questions. You can either raise your hand and I will call on you. You can unmute and ask your question or if you'd prefer to type it into the chat, I will be happy to moderate that for Jordan. Um, while our audience is collecting their thoughts, I am going to drop a, a link in the chat to a brief survey. If uh, folks wouldn't mind clicking on that link and just completing, I think it's about four or five questions, I would really appreciate that. And then we will just give it a few minutes here while uh, our audience come, thinks of their questions. All right, Jordan, we have a question from Dr. Jellison. Uh, first, she says, great presentation, Jordan. Uh, why do you think it took so long to get federal anti-lynching law passed, a federal anti-lynching law passed? Um, I think it would just be the reluctance and unfortunately the reluctance to acknowledge these past atrocities. Um, you know, there were so many groups starting with Ida B. Wells and there were even um, a group of white Southern women. Um, it, I think it was called white women against um, or preventing lynchings who actually got together and said, we're, we're not going to be the excuse for you lynching black Americans. Um, there were these constant um, advocates um, to, to have federal legislation and you know it's it's astounding that it's taken so long um you know in the early 2000s there was a, again a bill trying to be passed and i don't know if it's because we uh, i don't know president biden is president now um you know politics have uh, changed a little bit but it's it's absolutely astounding Great, thank you so much. We do have another question in the chat. Lorraine Walkna is asking, uh, will you be connecting the Underground Railroad to the idea that the North was seen as more quote unquote liberal? So I haven't done much, much research with the Underground Railroad and connecting it um, to racial violence, but um, that is an absolutely correct statement. Um, so I haven't looked into that. It's an interesting thing that I can take into consideration when I'm um, moving forward with my dissertation, um, but I haven't done much research on that. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have another question from Brian Schoen. He says, excellent job, Jordan. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship on Southern lynching. Do you think that the same motives led to the Midwestern lynchings or were different dynamics in play? 
Um, I do think they have similar um, motivations. So when I was looking at the census records, I saw a lot of migration from southern states um, to the Midwest, to northern states. Um, so it could possibly be that these views were migrating into these areas. And just like I said um, before, that these um, views of white supremacy were, were widespread. Um, you know, it was that um, Northerners and Midwesterners were re reliant on slavery and held these views of white supremacy. Um, so I think there are these similar motives, um, you know, with Ida B. Wells pamphlets, she, you know, explained and focused on the South. Um, she explained that rape was um, often a common accusation. And with these five lynchings that I'm looking at now, you know, that was the majority of, of the case. So I do think there are these similarities. All right, we have another question in the chat from Kelly Broughton. Uh, she says, thank you for this work. What is the one thing that you learned through your work that you wish all Midwesterners knew about this topic? Um, again, I would just say that it's important to know that this area was an important spot for black education, work with the Underground Railroad, but it's also important to acknowledge um, that racial violence was widespread. I think that would just be an important thing that I would want Midwestern Midwesterners to know. Um, yeah, and just hopefully spreading. Um, I want to see more commemoration projects. I hope more people hear about what the Equal Justice Initiative is doing. I really would like these projects to spread uh, so the, the public gets um, more education on on these issues. So that's that's one thing. Thanks, Jordan. Um, I'm just going to give it another minute to see if we have any other questions coming into the chat, or if anyone would like to raise their hand. I think that's it. All right. So I, with that, I think we're going to wrap up for this morning. Jordan, thank you so much for, for sharing your most excellent work with us. And we, we look forward to seeing more from you in the future. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you have a great Friday. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone has a great day.